Coach Cal. Let's talk about it. And that is very scary. He was low-key better than Jordan in that series. Welcome to Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano presented by DraftKings. Don't forget, DraftKings is your home for all the action across the NBA and gets you closer to the game we all love. The crown is yours. I'm just going to get some business out the way. Uh, Later in the show, we're going to have John's former teammate in 2009, NBA champion Trevor Ariza joining us. But I've been excited. I haven't talked to John here since some major news broke out a couple of days ago. So... Just want to introduce John, John Wall, our co-host on the show, <laughs> Point Game. John, how are you doing, man? I'm great, man. Uh, I got opportunity to uh, – I went to Cabo for a little vacation, a little business trip. Um, now I went to the Matt Downs All-American game in uh, Houston. And uh, now I'm back here, back in Miami, sitting down, relaxing for a little bit. I ain't trying to do no traveling until I go watch my AU team play. And uh, – Decided to get back to the podcast. I mean, we took like uh, two weeks off, uh, yeah. so we're going to make up for some time we missed. But uh, I'm excited to be back and uh, just get to talk about a lot of news and great things that's been going on. Yeah, man. I mean, I, you know, one of the reasons why I was like, we got to do a podcast with you is because when big things in basketball happen, there's always a good chance that it's going to relate back to you now. What I was alluding to before, <laughs> Coach Cal, let's talk about it. Coach Cal announced... I think it was a couple of days ago, and it's now official that he is going to be the new coach at Arkansas, so leaving Kentucky. What was your reaction to the news? Give us the lowdown. What, what, what's going um, on? It wasn't too shocking to me because just the way, like, you know what I mean, uh, they, lost a lot, they lost the game to Oakland, and you start hearing all the news, uh, do we get rid of Cal? We need to get rid of Cal. We need this. We need that. And um, I think of him, like he said in his, uh, his, his last message to the Big Blue Nation, I mean, it was his dream job. Then we have opportunity to come there. Experience everything he has done. Everybody know how big Kentucky basketball is. It was big before he got there, but I feel like he took it to a whole nother level. You know what I mean? Having a lot of guys come in, be number one recruits, uh, number one recruiting classes, uh, a lot of five-star guys coming there. So many guys that's in the NBA. I think, well, he had seven, eight guys that was in the All-Star game this year. A lot of number one picks that came through there. And, you know, a lot of people are based there legacy off championships. You know I mean, championships are great. Don't get me wrong. Like everybody wants to win them. And I feel like every school wants to win them. Uh, for him, I think it was just, that was his ultimate goal, but it was bigger than it also. You know what I mean? He built so many great relationships with people in Kentucky, with all the parents, uh, the kids that play for him. And then you just see the love. If you go in the, the comments, all the kids that's, you know I mean, you're going to have some haters. You're going to have some people that really respect and love what he did for him. Um, but for me, it, um, it's sad to see him leave. You know what I mean? I'm still a part of Kentucky. I'm still going to be Big Blue Nation. I mean, that's the school. They gave me opportunity to play on the highest level you can in, in college basketball at D1, one of the biggest schools ever. Um, and then get opportunity to go to the NBA. So, you know what I mean? That's always family to me. I have they jersey tatted on me. I'm in the Hall of Fame. So there's always love and support with Kentucky. And that's never going to change from that. But I'm always going to support Cal, too, no matter what schools he at. And I think he just, uh, like he said, it was just time. You know what I mean? Like, it's sad to see a, a breakup like that happen. But I think it was just time. Uh, you can see it in here in his voice, like he had like a lot more joy. He's getting that excitement back now, and um, he getting to start fresh. I mean, like you said, sometimes you need a new fresh start, even though you might want to be with that person and stay with that person. Uh, I think he needs a fresh start, and uh, he's doing what's best for him and his family. And uh, I just feel like it's gonna be a lot of pressure to whoever get the next job in Kentucky to kind of live up to what he did. You know, what I mean, it might not be the championships, but all the other things that he brought to the university. I think it's gonna be special. But uh, I think. Uh, the AD, Mitch Barnhart, going to do a great job of just trying to find somebody new, find somebody else to come in and keep the legacy going and build what he can. But uh, Arkansas got a great one in Coach Cal, and I think they're super, super excited. Yeah, and we'll talk about maybe, you know, who who could fill that spot. But, like, I think there were, you know, there were a couple of weeks there when people are, you know, I think some reports are coming out that Cal's staying. And, he, and a lot of this news, it, it's like you said, you weren't shocked. It makes sense. So, like, Let's go back to a couple of weeks ago when when it was looking like Cal was going to stay. Was there any thought to you in your head of like, man, why are you staying? Like, it's a lot of pressure. You've done a lot, and like the UK fans want championships. But like, you know, so w- were you in your head like thinking about that possibility that this could happen? 
Um, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, like, as, as simple as this, man, like, it's all what have you done for me lately. You know what I mean? Any part of business yeah. you're in, that's what have you done for me lately. And I think um, you want to be wanted. You know what I mean? You want to feel the love. You want the support. You want to be wanted where you are. And I think that void had just went away with the last four years of how things have went in the tournament, not going far, uh, having certain upsets against certain teams. I think, like, the fan base has just got to know it. But it's interesting because, like I said before, it's like everybody praised him for what he was doing then stopped praising him. You know what I mean? So it's a gift and a curse. But at the same time, now when he decided, oh, I might take this Arkansas job, now you hear all the fans like, no, we don't want Cal to leave. We want Cal to stay. But, like, <laughs> you kind of pushed him out. You know what I mean? Like, you right, kind of right. gave him the void to it. Like, but well, I'm not feeling the love and support I've been getting for the last 15 years when I came here in 2009, 2010. What am I staying for? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think – he found that his found his happiness back because I think if you just watch it, every coach wants to win. Like he, the difference is he has a lot of young guys. I mean, but we, he makes no excuses. He keep a couple of veteran guys, a lot of young guys. And you look at most of these teams that's winning. They got juniors, they got seniors, they got fifth year seniors, sometimes six year seniors because you get those extra years because the red shirt or COVID. And I mean, not too many teams go in there with a lot of freshmen and go win. You know, what I mean, it's, it's hard. It's very difficult. You know, you never been in that spotlight. Uh, you really don't know what that March Madness feeling is like. You know what I mean? It's one game and it's over. And then when the buzzer hit, you're like, damn, my season's over. You know what I mean? So it's different. Uh, but like I said, I'm happy for him. Whatever he feels is best for him and his family. You know, he always got a lot of love for me, uh, from a lot of players that play for him. Uh, I know the University of Kentucky love him. Uh, the Big Blue Nation fans still love him. Uh, it's just now you got to wait and see who's going to be next. Like, who's going to fill the void? Yeah. You uh, you said you talked to him. Um very recently and any tidbits you can share that that may have not been said by him or by the media at all no i talked to him yesterday i just said what's up coach how you doing i mean just checking on him. you know i mean because yeah it's, a, it's, it's got things somewhere you've been for 15 years that's home that's like where you've been you built so many great relationships you have done so many great things for a university so to start over start fresh is something new but and just in his voice you can hear the excitement like you know what i mean you get a new opportunity to start fresh and He's loved over there. He's got the support. He got the fan base that wants him. So it's sometimes you have to make that move, and sometimes you don't want to break have that breakup. But like you said, I feel like it was needed. They need a new voice at Kentucky, and he had opportunity to go get a new job. So I'm not mad at him for yeah. that. You got to do what's best for you at the end of the day. Now, I, you know, before this, I mean, yeah, it's been 15 years. Coach was at Memphis, national championship there. Um, or w went to the national championship and, you know, went to Kentucky and, and went far, you know, one in 2012. Do you think, you know, but like mainly I think the big thing people know Cal as, you know, he gets his players prepared for the NBA. Now that he's going to Arkansas, a team that necessarily we don't see go very far in the tournament. Do you think his, his sort of coaching initiatives or like approach to coaching changes at all? Or is he nope. still, you know, you go to get NBA ready with Coach Cal? Nope, I think nothing changes, and he still loves the yeah. coach. And I think that's the reason, one reason why he made the move is because he's not going to change how he coached. He's not going to change his pedigree. He's not going to change his style. Like we have to understand, he was the one and done king when coaches were scared to do one and done. You know what I mean? Like people were terrified of being that one and done. He started the one and done era. Like he got it going, and then you started to see the the guys at Duke and all these other great schools start to be one and done. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. People was terrified at that at first. You had to do two years or three years. I mean, because we were so many great talents before he started that should have been one and done or easily could have went one and done. But I think he, that, I think that's another big reason why he made the move. It's like, yeah, I want to win championships. Yeah, I want to go far in the tournament. Trust me, everybody does. I don't think no coach sits there and say, yeah, I got one and done players, but I don't care about winning. You still want to win. You know what I mean? But at Kentucky, it's a lot of pressure. They, they want to hang banners. They don't care about what the regular season record is. They want to go far in the tournament. You know what I mean? The last couple of years haven't been that for him and I think they kind of started to get to the fans and they wanted things to change and I mean sometimes you, you're stuck in your ways but I think he does a great job of what he does and hopefully he can keep doing great things at Arkansas and I feel like he's going to keep the same trend going that he had when he had Kentucky just Arkansas I mean because like I think he did it at Memphis yeah it's not like he didn't have a trend where he already had it going like who was really going to Memphis before Coach Kyle went to Memphis right you see what I'm saying? Like, who was going to UMass before he went to UMass? Right. You know what I mean? Like, great players were going to Kentucky regardless before Coach Kyle got it. Don't get me wrong. But then they had a downfall for a couple of years. You know what I mean? And IT a couple of years is not making the tournament. Then, boom, Kyle come back. You got a team like us come in. You get five five five-star recruits come in, five guys going the first round. You start off 18-0. and 0, You know what I mean? 
the next year you bring in the recruiting class of Brandon Knight and Deron Lamb and Terrence. You know I mean, you bring those guys in. Then the following year, AD and them come, you win the championship. You know what I mean? So it's just like he has a trend, and I think what he brings to the game and what he brings to college basketball is going to continue to go. And I think Kentucky lost a great one, but uh, we never know who they can replace him. Hopefully they do a great job also. Man, that, uh, so I, I just got, like, chills a little bit because I'm like, Coach Cal isn't just going to have, like, you know, he's going to bring some guys over there, right? There's going to be – he's going to want to come out out the gate on fire. Like, you know, we might see another 18-0. and 0. Like, what, what do you expect from that that program? Um, uh, I really don't know too much about the school. I know they got – I mean, it's a basketball yeah. school there and the SEC, that football school also, don't get me wrong. They have other great sports, but I don't really know the history about it or anything. Um, but I just think he's going to – keep the same trend going. I don't think nothing stops here for him. I mean, yeah. I think it's a different place. I've been in Kentucky where you have those crazy fan base that's probably the best in the country for me. Yeah. But uh, he's going to bring talent wherever he goes. Like, I don't think talent is going to not want to mess with Coach Kyle. I think they're yeah. going to continue to want to deal with him. Uh, the pedigree he brings, the area he brings, I think is great, just great for college basketball. So let's talk about the big, huge coaching va- vacancy over at Kentucky now. Are there some names that you like? Are there some names that you're seeing that you could see there? Like, talk about, uh, you know, some specific names and maybe even just, like, what what type of coach do you need over there at Kentucky now to, to you know, pick up on some winning ways? Um, I really don't know. I really just support the school, you know what I mean, support the basketball team, no matter who they hire as a coach. I don't really have a specific I like, you know what I mean? I enjoy a lot of college coaches. I mean, there are a lot of great coaches out there, don't get me wrong. I got recruited by a lot of great coaches. Uh, just my relationship and the pedigree that Coach Cal had that made me want to go play for a guy like that. You know what I mean? Um, but you know what I mean? Shit, you got UConn. <laughs> he just won another one. I mean, that's a hell of a coach what he's done. And you go back to what 2020 when he said, I think they had just became 10 and 7. He was like, y'all better enjoy the winning them because it's going to change. And uh, he's been around for so many years. I mean, his family's been through it. He's been coaching from high school to yeah. college to do that to that. Uh, but they got. They, they recruit great players, but, you know, they have a lot of guys as juniors, seniors uh, mm-hmm. that come in and, know, and play the right way. They know how to play, you know what I mean? But I, I read one of his quotes yesterday, and uh, it was dope to me because it was like uh, – And we're talking about Dan Hurley, right? Yeah, Dan Hurley, yeah. for sure, Dan mm-hmm. Hurley. Uh, it'd be good players – good players come in and want to be stars. Great players want to be a star in the role for the team. I think that was an amazing quote. You know what I mean? Because you, you, you very rarely get that from a lot of young guys that you recruit because we all come in as McDonald's All-Americans or projected to be this. And we come in, we want to be stars, like not just stars for the role of the team, but stars that everybody notices. You could just tell how he's building that that uh, program up. Don't get me wrong, that program's always been great. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think they should be one of the uh, big blue bloods, you know what I mean, that uh, one of those big blue blood teams, you know what I mean? They've been rolling, rolling, I think, since what – 2010, they might have the most championships from any college. You know what I mean? I think this is four. Yeah. They won one with Kemba, one with Shabazz. Uh, then Dan Hurley come in and win two more. So I think what in the last, since 2010 to now, the last two decades, first decade and almost going into the second decade, they already won four. So if you had one thing to con- one thing to say to convince Hurley to come over to Kentucky, because again, UConn's a, a good good school, good situation. They just won. What's the one thing you think Kentucky could offer? What would you say to convince Hurley to come over and coach Kentucky? Uh, for me, I I really I don't even answer that one because I wouldn't convince anybody. You know what I mean, I just hope they get a great coach. You know what I mean? Because that's my organization. That's, a, that's, the, that's the university I went to. I want them to continue to be good, man. I want to continue to support them. I want to continue to be able to go to games. Uh, whoever the new coach come, I want to be able to build a relationship with them so that I have the opportunity to come back and still use the facility when I work out. You know what I mean? Come around and be around the yeah. team and go to practice and then go to games and support. I'm always going to continue to do that because that place is like home to me. I mean, even though Coach Guy is separated, uh, that's still the place I call home. That's where I went to college. That's why I left high school and learned how to be a, a man on another level to prepare me for the NBA. So whoever they get, I hope is great. hope I can build a relationship with them and hope is a guy that can get them to where they want to get to and win more championships. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, the women's tournament and the championship too. Uh, but as a segue, people were even throwing Don Staley's name into coaching Kentucky. You think we ever – you think Don could handle that job and, and succeed, or do you think we'll ever see something like that? Oh. Uh, Man, the way the game is growing from women and men, and uh, you never know. You know, what I mean, I think uh, Lindsey Harding has opportunity to, to get an interview yeah. for the head coaching job. So, 
just to see like these coaches breaking the, these women coaches breaking the record of just being G League coaches, being assistant coaches on NBA teams. You know, what I mean, even in the NFL, you have coaches, women coaches on the sideline. Like, I think that's great for the game. And uh, Don Staley's a goat. You know, what I mean, like from being a player to coaching and what the, the thing she's done in a short amount of time has been amazing. You know, what I mean, so uh, it's a lot of support. And you just see the love. Like, that's the type of love you want your players to have for you. Like to play for your coach, you know what I mean? Like they love everything about Don, the way she carries herself, the way she is as a person, the way she believes in God, the way she prepares them. She does it at a high level, you know what I mean? So you have to respect everything Don Staley does, but what she has going to South Carolina is up to her if she want to leave. I bet she should get a lot of opportunities and I think yeah. she will eventually get opportunity to coach men if she want to. I mean, I think it just all depends on what she wants, but uh, she's a hell of a coach, a hell of a person and I respect her. Let's talk about that national championship, even in the Final Four, too. Um, your general reaction, let's sum it up, like from that Final Four that we saw that Iowa-UConn game, um, you know, uh, South Carolina took care of business pretty easily in that second half to go to the national championship. Same story, I think, for the national championship. You called South Carolina. Was there any, I guess, any doubt in your mind in those last two games where you're like, oh, it could be somebody else? Um, I just think. Iowa had a chance, you know what I mean? They beat yeah. them last year, you know what I mean? And they come in with a whole new team from last year. Uh, I think the biggest separation was it uh, their defensive game, game plan on Kaylin Carr was amazing. She missed shots, though, don't get me wrong, but the guy, the, the girl, Raven Johnson, played great defense, you yeah. know what I mean? She she uh, had a revenge tour from last year, you know what I mean, being on the team and them losing in the Final Four. Um, I think it was big for them, but I think the separation of the whole entire game was, and we all knew what it was going to be going into it, was who made the most threes, and could Iowa stop them on the rebound? And that's the key. You look at last night in the uh, men's game, they said, we'll let Edie kill. We can't give up threes. They only took seven threes, eight threes. That's probably the lowest they ever took all season. They only made one. You know what I mean, yeah. and that was a tough one on a fadeaway on a buzzer beater. So Dan Hurley was like, listen, we're not going to let them beat us with threes. So the game plan, what, what it basically was, was three. So I think uh, Don Staley and, they, and their coaching staff came up with a great pl game plan of, not trying to give us so many threes, but at the same time, Iowa missed a lot of threes. I mean, missed a lot of yeah. easy baskets. But uh, South Carolina played well, played great. And uh, they that's what they do. You know I mean? Great team. They separate and get that separation that they need. The same as UConn. UConn is always close, close, close. In that second half, they get that stretch where they go on a 10 to 13 to 15 run, 15 0 run. And it's hard to get back into the game because you can't speed them up. They're getting offensive rebounds and they're making their open shots. That's when it, it just gets tough. I, uh, I wanted to ask you about a specific player on South Carolina because I was watching her again and seeing the highlights. Uh, Malaysia Full Wiley. Well, mm. uh, I think you know the question I might ask, but like, what, what do you think about her game? And then Electric. I want to ask you about a yeah, signature move that that I, I've been I see she did the bond it back again. She missed it this time, but. She's super electric. Yeah, big time. I mean, they. I think it was ESPN said that that uh, women's national championship was the like the highest yeah, rated. Far, I think it was like eighteen point something million. Yeah. So they um, topped last year's. One one thing I wanted to ask you about Caitlin Clark and a lot of these, you know, the girls that are going into the WNBA draft is the draft is happening next week, and then the season is starting. I think May fifteenth. Talk. Can you talk about that turnaround? Like the time between. I, I think you had what. Six months before you became an NBA yeah, player, think, they have like two months. I think months. it's different. Not even two months. Come on, bro. They yeah. just they just finished the championship game Sunday. They're getting right. drafted this Monday. <laughs> you know what I mean, so your life changes that fast. You know, what I mean, like we took time. Like the men's play Monday yesterday. You don't get drafted to June. So That's look how much. Crazy. I mean, you got June, then you got the the, the uh, summer league. So they have time. You know, what I mean, to relax and prepare, but. uh I don't know. I think it's great. It's going to be a lot of great talent coming into the WNBA. There's already so much great talent in the WNBA now. Uh, I just love the the love and support that the women game again. Like for me, I've always been a fan of the women's game. Like if you notice me when I was in DC, I went to a lot of Mystics games. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm on the road and I have opportunity, I try to go to games and support. Um, and it's just exciting, man. I just love to watch basketball, no matter if it's men's or women. But I think, uh, the platform that they're getting now is, is, is spectacular and it's special for them. And uh, hopefully they can up the money for them to get paid more than the WNBA. You know what I mean? Because they're so gifted and talented. There shouldn't be no knock on if they are men or women. You know what I mean? If the NBA or the WNBA, I think they should get taken care of. Probably not. They probably won't get to the level we are. 
but they yeah. should get taken care of it very well, you know what I mean? Because if they want to go overseas, I think that should be for them to decide, you know what I mean? Or the ones that don't make it in the WNBA. But they're too talented to have to play in the WNBA and then go overseas to just make sure they're financially straight. They're too talented, yeah. too gifted. So hopefully they can make a change in that environment at some point. Last question before we head to break. Do you think Caitlin and Angel Reese, do you think either of them make the all-star team in their rookie season? I don't know. I got to decide on that one, but I think they're both going to be electric and spectacular. Uh, if Caitlin goes one, she get to play with Aaliyah Boston. So yeah. that'd be a great matchup and dynamic duo with her. You know what I mean, so I thought that was dope. Uh, Aaliyah calling the game and then, you know, yeah, she, that's what I said. And she, she, the revenge <laughs> tour in the way it did, you know what I mean? From losing to them last year to yeah. see Don come back and win. I think that was spectacular. So, and then knowing Caitlin's going to be on her squad next year. Yeah, so I wonder what that conversation was after she celebrated. Right, right. It looked like all respect between everybody. So, um, all right. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back on Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano, we're going to be joined by NBA champion Trevor Ariza. We'll be back on Point Game. Welcome back to Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano, presented by DraftKings. We are now joined by 2003 California Mr. Basketball and 2009 NBA champion with the Los Angeles Lakers, ladies and gentlemen, Trevor Ariza joining the show. Trevor, how's it going, man? Chilling, brother. How y'all doing? Good. Chilling, chilling, brody. Yes, sir. <laughs> I like when we get, you know, uh, John's former teammates on here because I feel like there's a lot of stories that probably you know you guys haven't told. So um, I, I guess I, I wanted to I want to know, Trevor, how was it playing with John at Washington? Do you have any funny stories? Like what was that experience playing together? Man, uh, I, I think I caught John probably like in his earlier part of his career, uh, <clears throat> where he was just starting to figure out the game. I would say so. In that space, in that time, we was, you know, we had it going. The, my first year as their, as his teammate, we were sorry as hell. It was frustration. <laughs> but the second year that we were teammates, that's when, like, every, that's when he took off into who he was as a player. And everything just went upwards from there. You know, he got everybody involved, cannon down the court, you know, take two or three dribbles. He already at the other end of the basket. And that it made everybody else's job easier because all we had to do was run the lanes, either run to the three point line or run for layups, because he put so much pressure on the rim. So, you know, being getting the opportunity to to play with somebody like John was a uh, it was good for him. It, it made my job easier. Yeah, Trey, I was telling about the game. I, I forgot how many threes you had. I think you had like thirty eight or forty. It was in Philly. In Philly, how many threes you hit like in the out. first half? I don't know. I think it was like eight or nine, how- but it was just like. This is when the NBA was like, they used to always like tag and not really switch pick and rolls and help. And I was like, all right, I know what my shooter is. In transition, he was running to the slot and in the half court, he was deep corner. And they just kept helping, help, help. And I was like, we ain't got to really do too much. Like he's making shots. But uh, for you, Trev, I just, you've been my OG since we first met in 2012. Uh, we played together for 2012, 2014. And unlike most vets, bro, you came in very silent. You always was about business. But when you spoke, we all knew it meant business. Uh, yeah. it was, it was no bullshit. So I just want to give you a flowers and let you know how much you meant to me. And I appreciate it because I'll never forget, uh, we playing our first game to, in playoffs against the Bulls. And I was jogging back like two minutes into the game. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? Get back. I'm like, bro, what you mean? He's like, bro, every possession means something. Yeah, and I mean, man. from that, and that, from that day forward, like I had a lot of vets, but you came in early and taught me how to be a professional, like how much every possession meant, no matter what. And uh, never to BS around. So, you being who you was, Mr. Basketball in LA and uh, going to UCLA and then leaving and not probably going first round when you thought, like, how did you manifest your career to get to where you wanted to? Like, what made you put that work effort to it? Because, you know, you was one of the star players in high school and all that and then yeah. go to UCLA. Man, for me, it was just standing that everybody's journey is different. Uh, some people, some people, you know, get things. I mean, obviously you don't, nobody's getting anything handed to them, but people are making decisions on other people and what they can do. And my job always was to, uh, or mentality was to show people that they really, you know, I'm one of those people that kind of slipped through the cracks a little bit. So that kept me focused. That kept me motivated. And, um, 
I always knew that I was I felt like I was one of the best players uh, for what I for what I do um, around the world at the time. So um, confidence never was nothing. I always bet on myself. I always did that because uh, I know the type of work that I was willing to put in, and um, I knew where I was willing to go to make sure that uh, winning was the main priority. Yeah, going back to because I think you know people consider you an LA basketball legend, but a lot of people, you know, casuals are like, oh, because he won with the Lakers. But you grew up in in LA, played for Westchester. Um, I also I have a fun story. Back in two thousand three, Westchester came. I don't know if you remember this, Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, McDonald's to play classic. McDonald's Classic, and I became friends. I was I was like a freshman. I became friends with Hassan Adams because he liked my uh, academic sweatsuit, and he goes, "Where'd you get that here?" And I was like, uh, "I ordered this online." So Hassan Adams was like asking where to go and eat when we were there, and so and I got my Slam magazine signed by you and Hassan and some other guys in that squad. Um, man, that's crazy. But that's what I want to talk about. Like Westchester, not only in LA, but you guys were like a team that was on the map that put that like Slam talked about. Like you guys were kind of stars. So can you talk a little bit about your time at Westchester and like the LA basketball scene? At Westchester, it was for me or for all of us really. It was it was like. So they had like a like like a status on you know what you would do if you if all these games were on tonight, and it was the Lakers, the Dodgers, the Comets, Westchester, <laughs> and then the Clippers, and everybody else. <laughs> but you know, at that time, it was dope because playing with all those players, we competed against each other every every day to make each other better. Only thing we really cared about doing was playing basketball. And uh, it wasn't like how it is now where, you know, you could just see everybody or know what people are doing. You actually had to, like, be there to witness what was happening at that time. So every game of ours, we really, like, brought a lot of people out, brought a lot of students out, a lot of adults. And that kind of just got us going because we were excited. Yeah, I played Westchester. They beat the brakes off us at City of Palm. They had Dwayne <laughs> Poli. They had Dwayne Poli and uh, the other kid. What's his name? Jordan something. He could shoot. Jordan Mays. Yep. He went to Arizona. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I was mad about that. I didn't want to tell nobody about that one. <laughs> we always we always whooped ass in the City of Palms Classic, though. Yeah, y'all was nice. Yeah, y'all was cold. <laughs> uh, so, Penny, T-Mac, and Kobe, they were your favorite players growing up. Yeah. What was it about those players that made you gravitate to their game? Well, T-Mac, just, he, was, he was so smooth with his game. Like, that hezzy pull. Hang dribble pull was, I don't know, that shit was like <laughs> opening up the Bible and watching but <laughs> and reading it. But T-Mac was always cold. Kobe was always a killer. And Penny Hardaway, he was just like, he got the little Penny doll. And his their body types are similar, mm-hmm. similar to mine as well. So I always kind of just like idolized the way that they play. And I wanted to figure out how I can like uh, incorporate the things that they did to to my game. Yeah. Was, yeah, Penny was tough, man. I just hate he got injured because he was so tough. For real. Well, Penny you know, never the, got hurt. Yeah, it's the biggest part. We all, you know, we always say, like, if nobody got injured, what if? But yeah. you could just yeah. tell how gifted he was. And I had an opportunity to see T Mac when he was at Mount Zion for that one year. Oh, yeah. And I was young, young. Like, I just was starting to figure out what basketball was. And I'm like, damn. Because Mount Don't Zion's forget. one of those schools to go to. Yeah. I'm like, Don't damn. Forget. You can't also forget, like, when, like 94, 95 or whatever, like when he was when Penny played for the Magic and they were playing mm. against Jordan. Yes, the Bulls. <laughs> he was low key better than Jordan in that series. Yeah, I watch. Yeah, I watch. I watch, the, I watch YouTube highlights. So like me, I'm big on like I watch basketball all day. Women, boys, I'm on YouTube so I can see like how great they was. You know, I mean, it's not the same as going to games, but I was no. too young to understand. But I just wanted to see like how gifted he was, and I was like, damn. Yeah. Very creative, man. Uh, a player before his time. Yeah. Trevor, you talked about that order where you were saying Lakers, Dodgers, Westchester, Clippers. You actually had an interesting tie that I've heard the story a couple of times, but I had some follow-up questions that, you know, everyone knows, you know, Q Rich and D Miles with the two taps. Um, apparently, you know, the origin was, was they were coming to watch you guys. Can you give a little bit of explanation or backstory on that? So, uh, what is Knuckle Up? Yeah. Well, when we were in high school, um, we used would anybody do like a, a crazy play or 
Hassan or somebody will throw it off the backboard to Hassan and he'll dunk it or somebody hit a deep three. And we'll just turn to each other and just like tap our head, like knuckle up, like get ready for war because it's, you know, it's going down. You know, who's in the trenches with you? We're always in the trenches together. So, you know, we just knuckled up. And so the the Clippers were in the crowd. They had saw that, and then that made it to the what we know it as. Well, when they got when D Miles and uh, and Q when they all got drafted, they were still really young. Yeah, you know, D Miles was still he was a year removed from high school. So right. you know, they took him as a high schooler. My school, or at Westchester, we were known for having like a lot of pretty girls at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it was just one of the schools to go to. So. Uh-huh. Everybody just – and we had a good basketball team, so everybody just liked to be around, you know, that way. Gravitate to it. Got to. Yeah. Uh, that that got to be dope, though, having two professional teams, like, in a major city like that. You know what I mean? Like, playing – because me being from North Carolina, we in Raleigh, like, we ain't got nothing. we like, Durham Bulls up the street. Yeah. <laughs> like, the Carolina Hurricanes. Like, for us, we would go see, like, NC State, Carolina, Duke. So, that was yeah. us. So I, so, I know, like, being, like – like being in a major city like that, being a dope program, school, like you said, girls, basketball stars, and then you got the NBA teams right here and the yeah. baseball team that could come see and support. I know that had to be dope. Right. It's 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 a gift and a curse, too, because you get jaded to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. We're here, Hollywood, the pretty, the beautiful sun, the palm trees, the beach. You could get jaded, you know, and yeah, everybody sure. is in L.A. So you come here and you'll – run across your favorite actress or, you know, musician, but then you still got to go on about your day and do what you got to do. So if you figure out a way to like make it here in LA, I feel, I feel like you fit in anywhere. Yeah. That's what I'd be saying sometimes. Cause I'd be like, I'm glad I'm from North Carolina because I ain't have the exposure to a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? Like these kids now get so much exposure so much. And I'm like, imagine being from New York, you got Jay-Z, A-Rod coming to your games. I'm like, I'm trying to ride in the car with him and go buy a chain and do something like that. Like, I just, I wish I had it, but I'm glad I didn't. So I know it could be tough for a lot of these kids now with all the exposure and access they're getting nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, you got to keep them grounded, man. You got to give them, I mean, as adults, we have, you know, vices and things that we pick up. So just imagine a kid that people know that everything is coming to them at, at one time. That's That's a lot. So being able to like stay balanced is a is a is a key factor in moving forward. Yeah. So I heard you speak is what Kobe means to you. You said Kobe vouched for you becoming a star in this league, and he believed in you. How did that make you feel? You know what I mean? Because you watched him, you looked up to Kobe, and have an opportunity to compete against him and just playing with him. I mean that 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 shot my confidence through the roof. Um, when I got traded to LA, I was coming from uh, uh, Orlando where I really wasn't playing a lot. You know, and uh, it wasn't because I wasn't, you know, as good or whatever. It's just it wasn't the style of play didn't fit the way that I played. So when I got to L.A., we had a couple practices or whatever. Um, just to, just me as a competitor, he seemed to like gravitate towards that. Um, I would guard him every day. He'll he'll meet me at the gym. Like he would never beat me there. He would always meet me there. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I think he took a liking to that and, you know, knowing that I will put in that type of work, it was only natural that uh, he saw a fit for our, our personalities to kind of mesh together because he was a worker. Yeah. I think. How did that that feel when the championship being in LA? I know that had to be fire. Being back home playing for, you know, me a team, you probably watched so much growing up and then winning championship for him. Like, yeah, that was crazy because, uh, again, winning out, I won at Westchester a lot. But to win for the Lakers, man, they blocked Figueroa off. <laughs> you see, like, all the people uh, coming out to watch our bus just go to the uh, to the Coliseum. And then getting in the Coliseum and, like, when they call your name to announce you because, you know, you won. And everybody chanting your name, that shit is unbelievable. That's like that was surreal. the best yeah. moment that I uh, I think or winning a championship here, just in the arena, just hearing the people like screaming your name is, is crazy. Yeah, 
talk, talking about Kobe and everyone has a story about, you know, how mentally tough he was. I, and tell me if I'm correct here. I feel like it was, it, he's underrated in how funny he was. Cause you shared a, uh, I think on his birthday last year, you shared a text exchange where you, you sent him a picture where he was shooting over a triple team. And then he responded, that means that it's, it's an easy putback for if I miss the shot. Somebody, the funny part about that is he was serious. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what made it so funny. He wasn't fucking around. He was dead ass serious. I, I think that was preseason too. That was a preseason game. <laughs> that's crazy. Do you have any other, you know, any other – like crazy Kobe stories or, I mean, you got to play with them in a championship year. Um, any, any stories that stick with you? Uh, well, something that I could share probably would be, um, we played in golden state one time and he had strain his, his, uh, adductor or something. And you know, that shit was like throbbing. He couldn't really like go like side to side. He could only go straight or backwards. But I think he strained in like the second quarter. By the time the fourth quarter was over, he finished with forty four. Damn. So like he could like he could trick his mind into like doing things that his body couldn't do uh physically, but somehow he was still able to get it done because of how strong his mental was. That's and tough. seeing something like that, then getting the opportunity to go play like with other like talents, that's kinda like how like I'll, I'll be able to like push somebody like John or push somebody like Brad to to be what they're going to be because I know because I've seen it personally that there's another level that you can go to mentally and if you can go through mentally something like that with the talent that that you know some of these dudes got the talent that John had nobody could fuck with him so that's as a teammate that's something that I always wanted to be able to do uh, with special players is is continue to feed, you know, that ego, feed things that they need to be great. So you're a dad of three, Taj, Trishan, and Taylor. I yeah. know that got to be amazing. So I see your son Taj, he a five-star guard, you know what I mean, straight hooper. How are yeah. you balancing being a dad versus being a, being a – how you very, uh, balancing being a dad being, and also being a mentor and giving him the real toughness that is encountered on, on the court? Oh, uh, yeah. That's that's a it's a tough balance because every you don't want to hear somebody's voice every day all day long. Facts. So like I gotta pick and choose um, when to like be the mentor or to critique his game and when to be dad. So like when he not when his room's dirty or something and it's shit to do in the house that he didn't do, I gotta be dad. So I kind of like ease off the the basketball. But when everything is in tag and order here at the house, he has a pretty good routine. Then I can like, like critique his game or like give him a little hint or a little pointers on things he can do to just become a better player. Yeah, and, I, and another one, I was like, how hard is it? Cause like I'm going, my kids super super young. They play soccer mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. But like, how do you figure out like, you know, like I always say, parents sometimes force their kid to play a sport because they played it. Mm -hmm. But you just let them fall in love with it. You know what I mean? Do they want to do this yeah. routine? Do you not want to do this routine? Like, how great do you want to be? Like, because you've been there, you've done it. Mm -hmm. And now I don't have to force you. I want to see if you really want to get there. Exactly. So what I did was up until the eighth grade is, or the summer the eighth grade is when, like, we decide on if this is something that you want to do or try something else. Because you'll see kids be, like, super nice from, like, the fourth, fifth, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, right? And then they'll get to high school and kind of, like, everybody will catch up to them. Mm -hmm. So my, like, idea was, all right, let me just let you naturally do whatever it is you can do. And whatever it is that you can do, I'm going to watch. And then when we get, when it gets time to, that it matters, or, like, when it gets closer to things that you really would need, then if you want it, you're going to show me that you want it because you're going to ask for it. Like, even now, like Tristan, Tristan is in the seventh grade. Every day he's hitting me up about going to work out or going to the gym or, or running or doing something. He always got a, a, a ball in his hands, but that's the hunger and the type of, like, mentality that I, that I think that you need because you don't want to – they play so many games in the summertime, you don't really want to burn them out. Yeah, we So you got to actually what? love this shit to want to do it. 
Yeah, because we playing, hey, we was playing three games Friday, three games Saturday. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. damn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because now, like you said, like nowadays kids don't even want to play AU as much. They want to just work out, work out, work out. And I'm like, mm-hmm. sometimes I get it, but you got to play a little bit to see where your game stack up against. But, yeah, that's dope. That's a good mindset to have. Plus, I also, they they grew up different than the way that I grew up. So I, I kind of like – I give them things that they got to figure out on their own. Like this morning, figure out how to get to school. I'm not taking you to school. Nobody's taking you to school. Figure it out. (laughs) Because, I mean, in life, you got to figure things out yourself. And nobody's going to be there to uh, figure it out for you. So I try to, like, put lessons of life into, like, their age bracket and the things that they can do. Trevor, I I saw that actually your your son uh, is transferring to Westchester. Um, what does that mean to you? How much does that mean to you? Um, you know, with that news, uh, it's like it's full circle, really. Um, it's it's cool for me because uh, it's almost like I kind of hold a controller a little bit, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be like myself. But you know, the decisions of school are all his, and what he what he really wants, or what he would feel comfortable. So. Um, I get to like literally sit back and and just watch my younger self play at my old high school again. It's That's it's crazy. really weird. It's dope. I know you got. It. I know you can't wait to see that to see the flashbacks. Yeah, I'm excited. Like even going up to the school. Like when I when I have to go up to the school, it feels like it feels good to be there. So I'm excited for him. That's crazy. And am I correct in saying that Arkansas is looking at him? So me and John were just talking about how. Cal was there. Um, mm-hmm. How serious is he about you know the schools that are uh, approaching him, and uh, does he have any colleges that he's he's really liking right now? Well, right now, he's really just focused on like how good he can get. Yeah, and that's what I all that's what I try to tell him: just keep your head down and uh, just focus on the work, focus on your school, focus on basketball. <clears throat> when the time comes for you to figure out where you want to go or what makes sense for you, then we start you know, talking about it or, or, or like really, really, really starting to focus in. But for now, I want you to like see how hard you can grind, how many days you can stack together on being as good as you can be. And that's what, that's really where his focus has been. Just, just in the work. How do you feel about high school kids getting NIL? Cause now you got it. Your son is in that process where he can, you know what I mean? Potentially yeah. if he want to take NIL deals or do it, like how do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? I don't know if this is something that's not never been there. It's just they got a name for it now. Yeah, for sure. A thousand percent. We all know. This. <laughs> <laughs> they just try to make it seem like it's more like it's cool yeah. to do now. Yeah. I mean, they was going to figure out a way to get it done anyway. But, I mean, I think it's cool. A lot of a lot of people um, get an opportunity to, to, you know, help themselves and help their families. And, you know, that's. That's a beautiful thing. We all go to school to get a better education so that we can support our, support our families better. Uh, I think that is cool that uh, amateurs get the opportunity to do the same thing. Yeah, I just think it's dope. Like, you've been a, a father figure that's their hands-on, you know what I mean? But you let your mm-hmm. kids make the decision. But you also mm-hmm. can guide them through it because sometimes I think it's great that these people can take care of their families, but sometimes they take it the wrong way. Yeah, you know no, I mean? for sure. And that's a good, I think that's the only thing I, that worried me about. It. I'm glad they can get paid and taken care of because I think we should have been doing it. Like you said, it's been going on, but now they just found a way to make it the right way. But I just hope the parents don't take it too far in the wrong way to, that, that mess their kid up from trying to get to where they really want to get to. I think um, another thing is probably just order, trying to, because once a kid gets money and kind of, and the family doesn't have much, it changes like the natural order of the way things are supposed to be. You know, the kid now becomes the head of the household and, you know, there's like a little, <laughs> some sort of like power struggle. But if, if like we can like figure things, figure that part out, uh, I think, I think things will be better on like in the long run. Yeah. For sure. Trevor, talking more about your NBA career, I was actually watching back some uh, highlights and I don't know if people talk about this dunk enough, but when you're on the Knicks and you dunked on Ben Wallace, that was an insane dunk. Can you talk a little bit about that dunk and maybe tell us your favorite highlight of your career? Oh, man. 
Let me see. Dunk it on Bill. Ben, ben Wallace was the, uh, they just won the championship, yeah. right? The year before. Defensive player of the year. He's been the defensive player of the year the whole time. We getting drugged at the time anyway. <laughs> I think we was getting popped. But um, NBA was a little bit different. So I caught the ball, I think, like 15 feet out. Yeah. Did a little pump fake. She did like a little swipe by. <clears throat> I get on my little launching pad. And that was it. He fouled the shit out of me too, by the way. Yeah. Got <laughs> in my face. But that was crazy, though. That was... That was probably one of the craziest moments of my career. Yeah. Any other any other dunks or highlights or even just, you know, plays that come to mind when people talk to you about, you know, what sticks with you? I, I think I played in Orlando one time and I dunked on a Donald Foyle. That was pretty bad. I don't I never see that one though, but that one was crazy. And then the one on Chris Kamen when I played in Houston. Yeah. I mean, he was for, for the Clippers. That shit was crazy. <laughs> they might they might have took it off YouTube as well. It's so old, man. <laughs> <laughs> and back then, you dunked on Ben Wise like that and got fouled like that. You might get a flag on one or two nowadays. Like, you might be out. That, that's a question I want to ask, though, like, because you played in different areas where, like, you could be physical to now you can barely touch anybody and you've been a great defender. Like, is that was that a hard adjustment to make? Because you could be physical, you know what I mean? You could bump across the lane back in the day. Now you can barely breathe on anybody and it's hard to guard. Yeah, you, you just got to figure out ways to be who you are in, within the rules. So, like you said, when uh, when I first got into the NBA, if somebody came through the paint and you didn't touch them, you was coming out. Like, you got to check people coming through the paint. So, once the rules got a little bit different, you found different, like, fatalities or different, like, techniques or different ways to uh, approach the situation. So, like, for me, let's say – you are on the like a UCLA cut, right? And your man go on the front side instead of the back side, and I'm at the nail. I'm gonna check you. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you can't. I, I just can't let you get a free run at the basket. That's gonna, you know, if you get yeah. that, then later on, you, the referees might call foul if I don't check you earlier in the game. Mm -hmm. So really, it's about setting the tone <clears throat> and being true to who you are within the rules. I still think there's some sort of physicality. It's just it just looks different. So instead of like giving like a, a forearm or some like you body check them or something. Like yeah. That. So yeah, it's a, it, it's a little different. It's it's the same, but it's different. Yeah. Learn the rules. Learn new techniques for sure. Like you said. You you guys talk about the new NBA, but I, I saw this meme today that it, it showed Rondo wearing LeBrons, and it's like this is how crazy LeBrons. Um, sort of time has been that players who have since retired were rocking his signature shoes. Now, I, I know one of LeBron's biggest high school games, Trevor, was against yeah. Westchester. Can mm -hmm. you – and you've played against him. You've been on part of his team. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, on LeBron, like seeing him and playing against him in high school and then also playing against him and playing with him in the NBA? Man, he it's pretty much the same thing. There's no difference to me. He's – for like my age group or whatever, he's been the best player for, since 15 years old until 40. <laughs> so <laughs> only other person who could say that really probably is Kareem, that he's been the best player since he was 15 up until he 40. And Brian is still going. So the things that he's done, his accomplishments, he's like, surpass expectations like I don't think that we've ever seen in the game before. Well, we definitely haven't seen it before. When you're playing or when you're like um, have to compete against those guys, you don't, I mean, you, you, obviously you let them know you have respect for them, but you never, because you still have to compete. So mm -hmm. any slight type of edge um, that players like that can get, they'll take. And so like, th yeah, throughout my time or throughout my career, I don't want to give nobody an edge because I'm already guarding the toughest players uh, every single night. So, yeah, I'd rather make my job as easy as I can make it <laughs> <laughs> under the circumstances. Take it away from basketball. I know how much your kids mean to you. Like, what does, what's the best moment about being a girl dad? Man, you have to be completely different with, with girls and boys. You know, I can cuss my sons out or whatever, 
you know, and then my daughter will look at me while I'm cussing them out. <laughs> and then, like, I just turn into mush be- because she wants me to, like, you know, pipe down a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it's weird, but, you know, I also have to, you know, pick and choose when to be firm with her as well, too, because just because, you know, they're different, the obstacle is still going to be the same as they grow. So um, just having that balance of knowing when to to uh, ease up and when to uh, be lay it on. And, yeah, it's, it's, they say, they say girls balance. make you soft, so I had to ask, you know what I mean? Because I ain't got one, but that's one of my goals <laughs> in the future is to have a daughter. Have a little, have a and they're like, it's going to make you soft. I'm like, bro. Uh. <laughs> yeah. It's going to make you look at things a lot different, like everything. You know, oh, for sure, like, a thousand percent. Yeah. <laughs> that was a percent. That's what we need, though. Sometimes we do need that to give us a chill pill. Trevor, you played for a lot of uh, NBA teams, and so I wanted to know: what was your? Do you have a favorite team or a favorite city you'd like to live in? In your, I got a few. Yeah. And since I play for a, a few places, I I get the luxury of saying that I got a few places that are like you know my favorite. Uh, Houston, sure. obviously playing home, DC and Miami. Those were my favorite places to play in. And what 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 is it about the environment in those cities? Like, uh, well, <sighs> in DC, it was the team that I enjoyed the most. Yeah, the team was more like I think that's the closest that I was with uh, with like a full team. You know, like you have players that you fuck with from other places or people that you know prior to being in the NBA that you just are cool like that, but. When I was in D.C., like the environment <clears throat> or the locker room, I should say, we John and them did a really good job of, of making sure everybody felt uh, at home. That's the only way you go from being that sorry to like turning around and being that good. You, you got to feel comfortable. You got to feel safe. Uh, and you got to know that your teammates are going to be there and what they're going to do. So it's almost like. When we were in, when I was in D.C., everybody just knew what to do from like just the, the system and the, and the tendencies that uh, each player had. But playing in L.A., that's home, so you know I was used to that. I get to go home to you know my brothers here, my mom's here, my all my friends. So if I ever got like <clears throat> uncomfortable or didn't or or didn't feel like you know, being around my teammates, I'm I'm right here in Miami. You got the beach. <laughs> Man. We had it, bro. We, we was like, it was just like for me, like he said, like when I first got to the Wizards, we wasn't good and we were trying to figure yeah. out everything and moving veterans around. So when we traded for the veterans we got and then Trevor came around, we got other more veterans. It just made it better, you know what I mean? Because he knew how to be a pro. He made us learn how to be better pros. But we just, like he said, we did team dinners. We go movies. We was doing all this together and that's how you build your camaraderie. But we felt like if we didn't get, we just one piece of, like we could, over the paces, we couldn't get over the hump, you know what I mean? Because right. I was still figuring out how to be a master at the mid-range, and they did a great, great game game plan. And then we gave away leads that we didn't know how to close them out at the time. But we yeah. feel like we we matched up with them because we had Trev to guard LeBron. Like, we're not saying nobody's going to stop anybody, but Bron couldn't help off as much as he wanted because Trev was a knockdown shooter. And a lot of teams, if you didn't have that, Bron is roaming and you're in trouble. So we just felt yeah. like we matched up with him. <laughs> And he closed out hard as shit. That's, I think that's the underrated like part of his. No, seriously, though, like, he'll be in the paint, head on the rim <clears throat> to, to clog up the paint. So you kick that ball out, he's in a full-on sprint to get to wherever his man is Damn. to close out. And, like, when your best players are doing things like that, everybody else falls in line. Mm-hmm. Like, everybody else falls in line. So, yeah, he just – I don't know. That's how good he is. He's so good at other things that things that are small. You, you don't even realize like how important they are. Yeah, you like, he had good co- yeah, he had good coaching. Learned it from an early age that all even the little things go a long way. Well, I, I, I was curious because you know with both you guys, like your most of your life, your your goal is to make it to the NBA. So you made it to the NBA, and Trevor, I'm. We have so much life left, you know? So what? what's like a new goal that you're sort of chasing in this phase of your career or life? What do I want to – well, obviously uh, to see my kids, uh, you know, be an everyday father, that that was one of my goals. But 
outside of like things that are serious or things that I have to do, I like to travel. So my goal is to see as many places and get to as many countries as I can get to <clears throat> just to see like how they live, things that they do everywhere. Yeah. Which would be answer, CJ? <laughs> Yeah, now, for me, like you said, like just we travel so much when we playing, and um, not with our kids as much. You know, what I mean, our family is basically our team. I spend so for many sure. days with them. Uh, just seeing my kids go to school every day, pick them up, take them to practice. Uh, for me, just investing, find other things to keep my mind going, continue to work out to stay in shape. But uh, I didn't travel a lot when I played, so like for me now, like I'm traveling. Like, I want to see the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. I ain't travel as much when I play. And everybody, like, why you don't travel? I'm like, I do on a motor, but we don't never know when our time can end. So you got to take full advantage of it. But like you said, just being able to see your kids, bro, take them to school and smile on their faces for me is exciting. And for him, I know it's even more exciting because he has a son that's in high school on the, on the verge of going to college. Then opportunity to be in the NBA, and you can't ask for nothing better than that to follow in the footsteps and kind of see the path that you was on. Yeah. The best part about that is is guys like y'all. I could just call y'all and get into his shit like, hey yo, man, he's this is what he looks like right now. This is what he's not doing. <laughs> call at him. <laughs> yeah, cause it's funny because his son played on my AU team when he was younger. Mm-hmm. He did. And then yeah, he moved, moved then he was moving yeah. to LA and I was like, damn, fuck, I'm <laughs> gonna stay here. But it was yeah. perfect though. Like, but like you said, like you get to the point where you finish in eighth grade, what you really want to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. if you want to take it serious? We can move here and get get straight to it. Like, cause you have yeah. the you have the blueprint. You in LA? You have your friends that train. You know how to train. You still in the gym working out. So that mm -hmm. got to be even more motivation for him. Yeah, it it is. I think because <clears throat> although like we have the same frame and we are probably the we look the exact same. <laughs> he he's he's completely different than I am. You know, and he has a different skill set than me. The thing that I try to get them to to do or learn is the things that I did. That got to be your base. Like that got to be something that is always, always, always on point, and that's playing hard and playing defense and rebounding. Yeah. What What's that like when when he you're watching him play other former NBA players? Um, you know, kids. Is that kind of wild? Where you're like, oh, that's Scotty's kid. You know, that's LeBron's kid. Like, it. it or are they just like, no, there's just another guy that I got to play against? Uh, I think for them, again, because it's through their lens, it's just someone that they have to play against. Yeah. They all have, like, a target on their back because they're kids of professionals, you know? So, like, everybody's always going to be, oh, that's such and such, such and such. That don't change being in between those lines and having to compete. So, um that's one of the things that I always try to like uh, let my kids know, like y'all have to fucking compete at all times. You never know who's watching. And everybody want to take your head off. So strap up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Trevor, John, do you have anything else? No, I feel like that's good. What, do you have, do you have any other memories? One, one last memory to sort of leave us on of playing with Trevor. Oh, hell no. We got a lot of them. I'm not <laughs> spoken of, but we got a lot of them. But my biggest thing, like I said, I just want to give him his flowers because you don't have a lot of vets that come in and teach you certain shit. Some vets, is they be alter ego and don't really want to help the young guys. And learning from all my vets between him, Drew Good, Al Harrington, Andre Miller, Nene, Gortai, all those guys, they helped me try to help the younger guys that came after me. So as long as I gave him his flowers, that's all I really cared about. That was the biggest thing for me. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I'm 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 one of those people that kind of like to just like, if I could fly under the radar, I will for sure. Because I don't. You know, That's why I, I said if he's silent, you're not gonna hear him. Like he'll be in a room and he just be to himself, cool. But that's how you always be because when you be real and be to yourself, you don't ever have to fit in and remember what you're trying to do to be somebody else. And that's what we always respected. Because he came yeah. in, he didn't try to take over the team. He was like, I'm the vet. I'm gonna teach y'all certain ways. I'm gonna stay out the way. But when y'all fucking up, we, his voice was definitely heard. It wasn't no bullshit when he had to say something. Yeah. And I appreciate that, too, because, again, like, they didn't have to – you guys didn't have to listen. You know, you guys are lottery pigs. Y'all yeah. are 
y'all are faces in franchise. So like y'all didn't have to listen. So I, I appreciate the fact that you guys respected me enough to, to hear what I had to say. And again, like just watching you guys play and watching y'all grow and watching y'all, y'all game grow. And, you know, I, I, I felt like a proud big brother because, you know, I seen what it was when I was there to, you know, watching the rest of you guys' career. And as it continues, you know, for my young guys, just watching them, like, continue to blossom is, that's like a, you know, that's a point of pride. Yeah, hell yeah. Like you said, like a big brother, some shit we didn't have. And like I said, it's always tough coming this because you never know how nobody going to act new team. You're going into a new locker room. And you got certain guys that's drafted high, like you said, they can be like, F the vets, I'm not listening. Mm-hmm. And the vets going to be like, you know what, I'm just going to do my job, but go ahead, go your way and finish it, figure out how you're going to figure it out. Yeah. But no, it's always been love. It's, I appreciate the, the the friendship, the brothership we have uh, coming in, being a vet, being a great teammate, bro. And it's great to see where your son going, seeing where you're going in the next part of your life. And you know what it is, bro. Appreciate you, dog. Yeah. Always appreciate you. Yes, sir. Trevor, you thanks too, for coming on. Appreciate it. Great meeting you, man. See, you should have brought your magazine, bro. You should have shown the magazine. I got time. the magazine. I got you see the magazine. I'm saying, Trev, he got a magazine. They didn't even bring it. Welcome back to Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano, presented by DraftKings. Just as a reminder, Bucket of Brick is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings Sportsbook is your home for all things NBA action, from player props to same game parlays. Check out everything DraftKings Sportsbook has to offer to make your NBA experience even sweeter. The crown is yours. We all know Bucket of Brick. John, uh, I'm going to make a statement. If you agree, you're going to say Bucket. And if you disagree, you're going to say Brick. Um, so you ready for this? This edition you know of uh, Bucket you know of Brick. That. All right, I, we got some good ones here for you. Um, so the first one, Tyrese Maxey. He scored 52 points on Sunday night, his second 50-point game of uh, the season. And then Joel didn't play. But he's back, and the Sixers, they're kind of like, I, I don't know, if they end up a seven, that's like a fake seven seed, right? So the Sixers are currently favored at 950 to win the Eastern Conference, meaning if you bet 100, you could win 950 bucks. So Bucket or Brick, the Sixers are going to win the East. Brick, I don't Ooh, think why? they win the East. I, I just have Boston winning. You know what I mean, I think complete yeah. team. I just have Boston winning. But if they finish seventh or eighth, the six is not a seven to eighth seed. So right, right. that is going to be a tough out for any team. First, if you first or second, no matter what, because they are a top three, top top three, top four team for sure when they're healthy. To me, uh, that's just how dominant Joel and Embiid is. Um, I love Nick Nurse as the coach. I love the access and pieces they added. And, then, you know, Tyrese Maxey is who he is. So I just think they're a better team. But, you know, injuries have made them fundle, fundle a little bit. What, what what edge do you give the Celtics? Because I think, you know, as you said, for there's some me, different factors. For me, I just feel like you have two guys that's glue guys that can fit on any team. And you don't mm-hmm. really get too many of those guys. And that's Drew Holiday and Derek White. Yeah. But I also think they just have the depth. Uh, they shoot the three well. Uh, they have two stars, superstars in Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. And I think Porzingis is the X factor. You know what I mean? Like he can pick and pop. And then if, you know, a lot of teams switch a lot, he's a guy that can you could throw the ball to in the post and he can score and get to the free throw line. So I think they just get him another dynamic adjustment than what they had last year. You know what I mean? Al Horford was the guy that would pick and pop, but he wasn't scoring in the post like he used to when he was in Atlanta or have the same face up game. Uh, his game has just changed. He's older. You know what I mean? So he's more of a still could defend at a high level switch out. He block shots, can shoot threes. And I think with Rob Williams, uh, he wasn't switching out as much. He was a lob threat for them. But uh, with Pazingas at the five, and sometimes they can go a bigger lineup and put Al Horford at the four and Pazingas at the five. Uh, I just think they have the right pieces. Uh, I think they've been to a lot of East Conference finals. They've been to the finals and lost. And I think they know that tandem. If they don't break through this year or next year, you're going to have to break it up. You know what I mean? Because they gave they, – they went all in. They gave up They gave up Marcus Smart. That was a great piece for them. Probably the most loved Celtics in a long time and uh, finding the right pieces for their team. So I think they're the team to – it's up to them. Yeah, that'll be a crazy first round. Like, that'll, that'll be exciting. Yeah, for sure. If that ends up being that. Uh, okay, second one. The Mavs have won nine of their last ten games, and Luka's leading the league in scoring. So, uh, bucket or brick, Luka's going to win at least two MVPs in his career. Bucket. Yeah. For sure. I think it's up uh, – I think if they were, uh, would have caught fire a little earlier, he would have had opportunity to win it. Or if Jokic would at least slow down a little bit. I think he would have had it. Uh, well, I think he still have opportunity to win it, but uh, I think it's between Luka and Jokic. Now, Shea was there for sure. Don't get me wrong. He was right there, but I think the last couple of games he missed, and I think that's kind of like 
those guys are playing and Luka got the Mavs rolling. And uh, that's a team that's not a seed that anybody wants to see because they had a great trade with Daniel Gafford and P.J. Washington. And I think Luke and Kyrie is figuring out how to play well with each other. Yeah. And that is very scary because we know Luke used to do the teams by himself. And we haven't and seen – had a score like Kyrie Irving. Oh, my God. And Kyrie being healthy and, and having oh, the man, he just he had in the playoffs. The other day, he's, he, he looked like he's happy again, man. He's just enjoying yeah. playing basketball. Oh, he's got a great place in his life from what you can see from him playing basketball in that piece. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, going back to college, last night, Zach Eady scored 37 um, in, the, in the national championship. They didn't win. But I'm curious because I've been going back and forth on this. Zach Eady will be a lottery pick in the draft. Bucket or brick? It's a tough question. It's a good one. Um, I just think it might be tough way defensively how the new league is, but for me, I would say a uh, bucket. I think you still just have to take them. You don't find a person that's seven four, right? Uh, that can score and, and kind of athletic. And um, I think you should have a good NBA career. Yeah. Why do you think that some people are sort of downplaying him? Like, well, I such think a just because force. his mobility of moving defensively. You know what I mean? A lot of guys, you look at it. You really don't have back to the basket scores as for, as big man. You got Yoga Jin and B. Other than that, you got to be able to move laterally. Uh, like Gobert, he can move block shots. He's impact the game uh, on, on the defensive end. You know what I mean? Then you got guys like Check that's playing the five. Uh, so going to space in the floor. You know what I mean? It's just so many different dynamics. But you just have to wait and see. I think he got better over from last year, Eddie, yeah. to this year defensively. So. I mean, probably something he worked on throughout the whole draft process and see where it goes. Yeah, something to look out for in the draft coming up. Okay, yes. final one, bucket or brick. Now, this has gotten some traction on our socials. The behind-the-back move. So, like, driving to the basket, putting it behind your back, that's your move, bucket or brick. Bucket for sure. <laughs> I feel like I made it. I think, you know I mean, I'm not the first guy to ever do it. Don't get me wrong, for right. sure. But I think uh, – just being in college, been in high school watching my mixtape, then being in college watching when I was doing it, to uh, when I got to the league and made it famous, and then probably one of my best dunks ever against the Hawks, I did that same move. And the difference for me, I, I do it full speed without slowing down. A lot of people do it, but they slow down. I'm going full speed, and there's no stopping it. Because I did it, I think you look it up against the Pacers. I did it, I went behind my back, and they kind of like George Hill kind of read it, and Lance Stevenson was coming to block it. And I didn't have to finish with my right. I leaned back and finished with my left, and they ran into each other. It was going into halftime. So I got different ways I can finish off that. I can go right, right, left, right, dunk. I got a lot of stuff, man. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. It's like you didn't invent it, but you've definitely – people started using it after seeing your highlights. Can you say who you learned that from or when the first time you started To be doing honest, it? bro, I just tried it. Like, for me, when I play basketball, I don't determine anything. It's just all instincts for me. Yeah. Like if I see a def- like one day I just seen a defender run this way and I'm like okay usually I can spin you know what I mean I'm not really great at euro steps that's not my thing you know what mm-hmm. I mean so I'm like let's try this and I tried it behind the back and it worked so I was like I'm gonna stick with it it's effective um, all right John well it's been another episode of Point Game appreciate you uh, presented by DraftKings everyone please. Go out there, rate, review, subscribe, leave the reviews. Everyone who also on our post left fan questions, keep doing that. Leave those in the reviews. Uh, We're going to have a future episode where John answers a bunch of those, and you guys will get some hoodies and some hats, point game merch on the way. John, anything else you want to leave the fans with? Oh, yeah, man. Great to be back, man. Uh, We ain't going to take no break like that no more. (laughs) Uh, But, like, yeah, we got (laughs) – we just enjoying it, man. We having fun. We got another special guest coming up soon. And uh, Yeah. Shout out to Trevor for getting on today. Uh, shout out to uh, South Carolina women and uh, UConn men for winning the uh, NCAA championships. And um, now it's just exciting to get ready for the playoffs. So uh, I can't wait to see. And I think we're going to have some great, great podcasts when the playoffs start. It's yep. going to be interesting. So shout us out, man. Come support us. Uh, Draft Kings, you know what it is, man. We are having fun and support us. Point game. Peace. Peace.